All right. Um, how many of you here know what KDE is and use KDE? Oh, good. This is going to make my job a lot easier. Um, since many of you probably are not developers and couldn't care less about the underpinnings other than what it means to you as a user, I'm going to give you guys a guided tour of the desktop environment, KDE 422. This is the latest public release of our offering to the community. Um, 4.3 is in beta now and will be released shortly. So um, I, we have a lot of exciting things, but I didn't want to tease people with stuff that distributions may not have for a couple months. Um, so with no further um, delay, I want to welcome you to the KDE desktop. When you start up 4.2, this is what you're greeted with in the stock um, KDE. We have a standard application launcher. We have a quick launch with all of your standard applications, a web browser, um, personal information manager, system settings, file manager, instant messaging, and of course, everybody's favorite, the audio player. Um, this quick launch gives you access to everything you need right off the bat. We also have a search bar where you can type in what kind of applications or a Google search um, right, at the, right at this command line. You don't have to open up a web browser. You don't have to open a find dialog and go hunting for what you're looking for. If you want to launch specific applications, you click on the Applications button, and it will, you will be presented with a menu that you can traverse through and scan all the applications that are installed on the system. Computer button allows you to see drives that are mounted on the system, um, hot pluggable devices, and um, commonly used folders. Uh, recently used, it's just what the name implies, it's a set of files that you've recently opened that KDE knows about. And once you're finished um, with the desktop experience, you can leave the session and log out. We also have on the bottom of here, we have a taskbar. This allows all of your Windows applications that are running to be listed and displayed. We also have a system tray, which displays both GNOME and KDE application icons that obey the XDG specification. Um, we also have the ability to add applets where you can, um, like this one specifically, will show mounted devices. We also have the network manager, which I'll talk about later, and of course, a clock. We also have other applets that do things like switching desktops. You can also, as a new feature in KDE, add specific, you can add applications called plasmoids straight to the desktop. Um, to do this, you would right click on the desktop and you're introduced with quite a few options. The first option, you'll see up in the corner there, the little black um, applet, that's a, cl a fuzzy clock, it's called. What you would basically do is you would select your icon that you want to launch, and you would drag it to the desktop or to your system bar down here, and it will dynamically add that applet to your desktop or the, t or the task bar down here. We also have the ability to grab new widgets from the network using something in KDE called Get Hot New Stuff. This um, basically allows you to go on the websites, kdelook.org, kdeapps.org, scan different applications that are available for download, and install them. You have the ability to search. You can, ser you can organize them by highest rating. You can get meta information. Um, this is horrible to read, I apologize. Uh, this basically will say how many downloads there were, what its ranking was, a description of the application, as well as the title. And it shows an icon preview. Um, you click Install. It appears up in this menu. From this menu, you can drag it to your desktop or the title bar again. One of the other options you have, too, is to change the background in the splash screen. This can be done if you right-click on the desktop and you get the top dialog up there where you can set the image that's displayed, um, its properties about it. And if you don't like the stock images, again, you can use Get Hot New Stuff to KD, look for KDE Look wallpapers, search by highest rated, and select which ones you want to install. 
If you want to uninstall it, you'll see that this one, the install button, changes to uninstall once you've added it. One of the other things that we've introduced with KDE 4 was we've changed the notion of the desktop itself. We remove the icons because 90% of the time they're obscured by windows. Fortunately, we've also kept the ability to add icons back to the desktop that are in the desktop folder. This is a feature that um, we do not enable by default, but if you go up to the top dialog and they have desktop activity, you change that from desktop to folder view and you'll get the classic desktop remaining. We also have the ability to change your KDE menu from the new style launcher to, an old, to the old classic style menu where you can traverse it similar to the way that Windows works. Now that you actually have configured the desktop to what you want, um, we're going to talk about the next thing, devices. Um, KDE 4 introduced a great new system called Solid. Solid is the ability to, it's a layer that sits on top of the internal hardware like HAL, UDEV, um, different audio servers, network manager, etc. It sits on top of that and provides an object-oriented interface so that developers can add this hardware support to all of their applications. One of these such applications is the media launcher, which when I plug in a USB stick, this dialog pops up. This dialog gives you the ability to launch, by, launch the file manager by clicking on the icon or to, by clicking on this, file, on this icon to safely unmount and remove the media. Once you've clicked on it, you're presented with our new file manager, Dolphin. Dolphin was introduced late in the 3.5 series and became main, a main application in the 4 series. Over that time, it's matured significantly and gained quite a few features with respects to file management. It's different than the years of using KFM, or Conqueror, um, as a single pane file manager. This one has the ability to introduce tabs, split views. Um, you can also traverse, um, you can, co you can um, copy from one pane to the other. Um, it gives you a few more features that were not available in the old Conqueror file manager. We also have the ability to display mounted network volumes and common, commonly used places. One other advantage of, of the Dolphin file viewer is we've added something called meta information. Some of you may have heard this buzz about semantic desktop, semantic web. Um, what this really entails is the ability to select, rate, and tag specific files. Um, I don't know if you can make this out, but there's a star-based rating. You can add tags to it, and you can give custom descriptions to every file on the file system. With 4.3, we're introducing the ability to search and query this meta information. So if you give a file a tag, such as music, you can actually search in the, um, at a later date for any files that have the tag music. That way, if you know what you're looking for, you don't have to hunt through folders or find on file names where you may not know the file name of what you're looking for. You just know the semantic information around it. So that, that's a very new feature um, that we introduced. Um, some of the other little nice things is they have icon previews. You can group folders. Um, by file types. We also have a neat little um, filter bar that will pop up at the bottom where you can start typing in like asterisk.pdf filters out everything but the PDFs. Um, you can start typing in a file name and it will filter your file view down. So it just, it helps with file browsing. It just helps make the experience a lot more streamlined. Because of this um, solid technology, KDE is also able to add network manager support. Network manager ships on most distributions right now, and if you're not using network manager, solid provides the ability to introduce your own 
network configuration system. Um, I've heard a couple people talk about Wicked earlier today, and um, it would be neat if we had that support within Solid so that every distribution would have the ability to use um, our use our network management. That's awesome. That's cool. All right, cool. Um, What, one of the advantages of this architecture is that, like, like he's saying, one of the Arch developers was able to develop a plugin that goes into the KDE system and are automatically their users will get this feature set. As application developers, we don't have to write special code for Network Manager or special code for Wicked. All we have to say is, I want a, wi a wireless LAN interface and I want to know what its signal strength is, I want to know what the IP address is, I want to know what my, um, what my um, ESSID is, I want to know if it's enabled. Again, you have your wired interfaces and VPN. All of these things are encapsulated so that you can actually, um, as application developers, I can write an application that can query the network interface and I don't have to care what the back end is. So it's, I, I think this offers the users a better experience and developers more flexibility with how they're writing their code. We also introduced a new system settings. Um, we used to have this control panel that we had for years and years. Um, and we revamped it trying to make it a little more streamlined and user friendly. As you can see, we have these Applet, we have a couple applications we can configure everything from your appearance to your desktop all the way to adding and removing packages, um, changing your display, changing multimedia functionality, um, network settings themselves. Can, instead of going through our little network applet down here, you can actually click on network settings, go in through that menu, and you're good to go. Um, one of the things that was added in 4.2 and um, was package kit. Package kit is a little um, little controversial because it um, is one of those features that either works or it doesn't. But what it allows us from a desktop point of view is that we can say, as an application, I need to install a multimedia codec. All I have to do is say install MPEG support and package kit will go ahead and figure this out, what package needs to be installed. So I don't have to write something that will only work on Debian or only work on Slackware. I can just say, install the codec, I don't care. So it's, these free desktop standards have helped us integrate tighter with the desktop and improve the desktop experience for end users. Um, some of the other things that we have, again, is this uh, multimedia. Multimedia with Phonon is a new technology. Um, as some of you may have known, with the 3 Series, we had Arts. Arts was um, analog, real-time synthesizer. Um, it was not analog. It was definitely not real-time. And it kind of did synthesis. So we got rid of it. We replaced it with a new architecture called Phonon. Phonon is more future-proof than Arts ever was. We use multiple backends. Right now, we have the ability to use GStreamer and Zine. There's a VLC backend, and there's also work on an NMM backend. These allow us to pick whatever audio server is or audio codex decoder is popular this week. That f makes it so that, as a desktop user, you don't have to worry that two or three years from now, you're going to have to disable your audio server just so you can listen to MP3s. Um, one of the big problems we ran into during the tail end of the 3.5 series is as things like Pulse Audio Server um, started to take off, people were using ESD on Linux terminal services. Um, <coughs> um, that started to make the sound system more problematic. 
We've kind of consolidated that into Phonon. Now, as an application developer, I can again say, I need to play a video. I need to play a sound. Go do it. You figure out the codex. As, an, as a distribution, they can then choose what audio player backend they want to ship with so that they can keep their codex consistent. Um, if you want to license stuff from Fluendo, you can use their system. If you want to use FFmpeg, you can use that system. You have a lot more flexibility as a user in a distribution. Um, the last part of system settings that's very new is display. We introduced in 4.2 and refined in 4.3 something called, I'm going to say it wrong, KFAL. Um, it allows us to integrate with XRender a lot better, detecting multiple screens, being able to figure out resolutions, change resolutions. A um, few of you probably saw me fighting with it earlier to get it working on the presenter here. Um, so it's, it gives, again, the ability for us to query through solid and say, I want to change the screen resolution, make it so. And then underneath the hood, it's figured out for us. So, and as a user experience, it simplifies your experience so you don't have to fight with X, X render or X render or um, mode lines in the XORG configuration file. This is a little more detail on package kit. Um, in the past, if you were using um, Ubuntu, you had Synaptic or Adept. Um, Slackware has their own system. Um, Debian has their own system. Everybody has their own way of adding or removing software. Um, with 4.2 and in in integration with PackageKit, we have the ability to use the back end, scan what software is available, scan updates, install codecs, uh, add and remove software from a common interface. We don't have to, as KDE, have to cater to only Debian or only Fedora or only Slackware. We can just say, you know, we want to be, as a group, we need to make it easy for the users to add and remove third-party software. So it's, um, it, it has its faults. It's not perfect. And there are some problems with package kit. But to, to be honest, the alternative is you as users have to learn how to run YUM or uh, dpackage or any of those ancillary command line programs. This gives us a consistent way across all platforms so that if you're using KDE and you need to install a package, you go right into here, select what package you want, and install it. Same goes for uninstalling. So it, 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 in the end, in my opinion, it makes the user experience, again, more streamlined. Now back to Dolphin. Dolphin, like Conqueror, has the ability to be network transparent. Back in the KDE2 days, we introduced something called KIO. KIO gives us the ability to deal with remote files as if they were local. Um, as you can see here, in Dolphin, I select the network tab, and I have the ability to browse network services. This is zero conf, so things like your Mac will show up, um, anything running, uh, Bonjour will show up. Um, you can actually see other people on the network, double click on it and chat with them um, through Copay. I'm going to show about that later. You can also see your Windows shares. And most importantly, what I use is a network folder. These are basically network shortcuts that use KIO. And you can put them as icons either in the sidebar here or they'll show up in the network folder. We support right now WebDAV, which is probably one of the most flexible and secure ways to transfer files to and from the internet. FTP, um, for those of you who still use that, um, Microsoft Windows network drives for Samba. This allows you to make shortcuts into Samba shares and whatnot. And my favorite one, Secure Shell. Uh, this allows you to type in a secure, go into any server that supports SSH, log into that server, and transfer files to and from your desktop. <coughs> this is very nice because you don't have to install a custom server. You don't have to install extra ports. You just 
it, anything with SSH installed, you're in, you got your files, and you're ready to rock. Um, once you've selected this, you type in your URL, click Next, and it creates an icon on your desktop. Again, you'll see meta information is present. Meta information is in every, is attachable to anything within Dolphin um, and any other application that supports this information. This meta information can be useful if you want to put network shortcuts along with your normal files. You can search based on any, anything in these tags and find out where your files are stored or any network, any network aware content. Um, another part of Dolphin is the icon preview. Um, this is um, some pictures that I took. Um, and this is basically, you're able to enable previews up there. And you'll get I, uh, fancy icon previews. You can zoom the size of the previews down here by zooming in and out. Um, you can also add meta information. You're presented when you hover over something with an icon pre with a bigger preview here. You can give it star ratings as well as tags, and um, you can give it descriptions. Now I'm going to talk a little bit more about the tagging and semantic stuff um, with respects to graphics and more non-textual information. The tagging and the rating and descriptions are more important. Because let's say I want to be able to say, I want to search for all the pictures from my Mexico trip. So I would tag these by clicking here and put in Mexico trip. And I would be able to say at a later date, I want to find all the files with these tags. And I don't have to worry about doing some funky algorithm to figure out, well, where are these from? What date was it? What, when, when was it? I can just file these pictures away and tag them. Um, <coughs> once you have that information, you can also go into the file manager or into the image manager, Gwenview, and get some more meta information. Right here, I've selected um, at the top there. It gives the um, a, l a little bit of information about the photo itself, and then there's a more button. Under the more button you have the ability to get all of the EXIF available information or any metadata associated with the image. This information is available <coughs> excuse me, through our semantic desktop so that you can search on this at a later date. The searching is becoming more refined in 4.3. Um, I haven't been keeping up the, the status of it, but it is um, integrated into every application. Again, you can see the semantic information. You see the rating, the description, and the tags. Those tags match up between the file manager and this image viewer. So any application that has the semantic information present doesn't have to implement it itself. It's all put into a central area. It's all centrally stored and shared between every application. The advantage of this is that application developers who would like to support semantic desktop or in semantic information inside of their application, they have the ability to go in and just by adding a few library calls, be able to add those controls straight to their um, display and get that information in their application. On the off chance that they're using a custom file format outside of normal images or text, a um, good example would be um, a GIS image format or um, special data files, uh, they can write a custom indexing or metadata extractor that will be installed KDE-wide and become available as soon as it is installed and the user queries the file. Um, some other information about Glenview. Glenview is the new image viewer. Um, it was KView in the KDE three days. And Gwenview came on the scene in KDE 4. We made it the official graphics viewer and um, kind of removed KView. 
Gwenview is um, neat. Um, I'm actually giving this presentation inside of Gwenview right now. Um, it is perfect for dealing with large numbers of photos. Um, in the, Digicam is finally ported to 4.3, but before that happened, the only way to really manage your photos is Gwenview. Um, it still is very good. Um, if you don't want to put up a full photo album and um, add a lot of custom information, if you just keep your folder hierarchy manually, you can just add, um, just index them and view them with Gwenview. Gwenview also has the feature of a thumbnail bar. If you click on this button, across the bottom of the screen, you're going to see a list of all of the a list of pictures and the icon previews on the bottom. We also have the ability to do simple image operations. We can rotate, queer, um, rotate, mirror, flip, resize, crop. We even have red eye reduction. There's also the KDE um, in, uh, mi image manipulation um, plugins, KIPI. Uh, that actually. Did I say that right? It, basically, what that allows you to do is any image application can plug in and say, I need to have the ability to create an MPEG movie out of a series of images. So our file manager has that plug-in. Gwenview has that plug-in. Digicam has that plug-in. So, and I think Show Image also. So it's any application has all of these image manipulation plug-ins available to it without having to have every application install something different. It also lets you use, as a user, use your favorite application without sacrificing features that are available for everybody else. Lastly, we have the file manager operations here. We can create, full, create a folder to put file images in, copy to, move to, and delete. Um, you also, if you want to edit the photo, have the ability to open with, and when you click on that, it will bring up one of the extra graphics manipulation tools um, under Linux. It's not limited only to KDE applications. You can use uh, GTK applications also. So it's, um, Gwenview as a whole is, is more complete than KView was. We also broke off the features for previewing files other than raw graphics to another program called Ocular. Ocular is kind of like a, it started out as a PDF viewer and then got on steroids. Um, it is an awesome program. It can, uh, it offers all of the things that KPDF did um, with scaling, resizing, um, text selection, um, copy and paste between things. Um, it gave you all those features, and then they extended the file formats. It can deal with faxes. It can deal with, um, I think, uh, XPS, P PDF, PostScript. Um, it, it is a Swiss Army knife of file viewers. It, it is a very powerful tool. So that's kind of where Gwenview and Ocular split off from KView as, from an application's point of view. Now to everybody's favorite part, music. <laughs> um, I'm sure everybody has very large legal MP3 collections. And um, Dolphin, again, becomes a good file manager to deal with these. Based off of the meta information, you can tag and you can rate your MP3s. And that's available in the other applications. You also have actions that are automatically associated to this file type. Since this is an MP3 file type, you have the ability to open with Amarok, or you can actually go through and do actions. Again, there's append playlist, append and play, or cue the track. You can also do things like encrypt the file or add to a juke collection. Juke is technically the official KDE audio program. Um, Juke is specifically for tagging and managing very, very large uh, music collections. Um, Amarok is more um, for playing streaming video, or not streaming, streaming audio, as well as um, managing. Um, it's more like an iTunes type of thing without the, the, the video. 
Um, it's a good. It's great for streaming. It's it's great for integrating with network stuff. It has plugins. Um, it's a neat program. But Juke is is officially the um, KDE specific MP3 player, um, and it's it's great for dealing with large um, MP3 collections. You can actually search using a filter bar, um, same one that is in um, Dolphin. So it's it's a pretty flexible application. Again, um, once you've opened this, um, I'm opening this up in Amarok, and Amarok 2 has a lot of new features, a um, <coughs> lot of new interface changes. The biggest one is that it used to be where the playlist was in the center. They've actually moved the playlist to the side here. And as you can see, it's more compact and it's more information than it was in the old one. When you activate and start playing an audio file, the main information ends up in the middle. The, main, the application itself, this middle part, has the ability to add plugins. I actually have only the album information plugin installed, but you can actually install things like browsing from Wikipedia, lyrics plugins, um, media devices, and you can have multiple pages of these plugins. You can also go on the, you get on the internet and install third party plugins as they become available. The, there in, in the current Amarok community is a very alive set of plugin developers who have been adding scripts and features to Amarok. So as, as an audio player, it really is becoming a very um, powerful to, uh, audio playing uh, piece of software, but it also has a great community that's very alive and adding a lot of new features all the time. The cool thing is, is since these features are plugins, they can come out later and the base Amarok can be out now. Amarok also has the ability to edit tags. It gives summary information, has the ability to embed lyrics within the MP3 itself, as well as providing player statistics, depending on how often you listen to something or um, whether or not you've rated it high or low. Um, one of the neatest features I, I like about this one is it allows you to guess the tags from a file name. So if I've named it correctly but never populated the meta information, it can guess that. Juke is a little better. They actually integrate with Music Brains and a couple other program, um, online features so that you can fingerprint the MP3 and then it will guess the tag information from there. Um, we also have the ability to save this meta information as well as clear it out. One of the neatest features of Amarok that I've found is the ability to deal with internet media. As you can see, the new Amarok has the ability to do shoutcasts. It has the ability to have bookmarked streams, gemendo.com, um, LibriVox.org, and Magnatune. <clears throat> These are online services that allow you to either purchase MP3s, um, download streaming media and play it, um, or to be able to just download podcasts. Um, this is very handy because I can keep bookmarks of the favorite podcasts and shoutcasts and keep them in their own playlists and come back to them at a later date. Playlists can be managed from this tab here and you have, it's just like the old classic Amarox playlist. They didn't change that too radically. And then lastly, there's the file browser and devices where you can deal with pluggable media like your iPod or um, any other media player that you have that shows up as a USB drive. Again, you have the plugins here. And lastly, um, you have the ability to zoom in and out. There's up to four pages of plugins that you can add, and the zoom out allows you to see all of them at once, or you zoom in and you only see this first page, this, the one page you're looking at.
Now on to chat, the thing that we all love to do after we're done listening to music. Um, Copy is advanced, um, is an advanced chat program. It allows you to use multiple protocols at the same time. It also sports a few plugins that allow it to ex you to extend the application quite a bit. The feature that I love the most um, is <clears throat> if you at work, we need to be able to move, um, talk to each other, and we don't always have um, the luxury of going through AIM or Jabber. We want to use something secure on the network, on our internal network. So we have support for Bonjour. It's the second one from the top. It's the same thing that Apple uses for their peer-to-peer -peer chat on a local area network. Basically, what it allows you to do is you set up a Bonjour account. It advertises you on ZeroConf. And then you can actually chat between two different users over this protocol. Um, not the most secure once you leave your own network, so it doesn't, it doesn't really work over a wide area network. For those, you're going to want to use one of the other formats. We have AIM, um, group-wise. We have um, same time for um, Lotus people. We also have um, listen, uh, Windows Live and um, Jabber. Jabber is probably the most flexible one because that will work with Google Talk, it will work with iTalk, and it will work with your own custom Jabber servers. So if you're lucky enough to have um, access to one of those, um, this is probably one of the better chat clients to deal with. This also supports rich text encryption. Uh, we can encrypt each message that goes across the wire. Um, we have the ability to add rich text, highlight messages, adding notes to your contacts information, um, <coughs> piping messages through an external script. Now listening to um, tell people what you're actually listening to now. Um, and for the four of us who actually use LaTeX, um, you can actually um, embed um, mathematical functions. We also support webcams, multiple styles of the chat window, and the ability to um, change the, the status and behavior of your chat client. You can also change the format of your main chat window as well as your um, icon, and you can set your away message as well as your status. One other, one other application in our information management suite is contact. Contact is, an, uh, is in a combination of K-mail, um, uh, K organizer, K address book, and jot. K jots. Um, this here is the calendar. It's a basic calendar that gives you the ability to browse the days of the week, add events, remove events, view events, set alarms, etc. Um, by default, we ship with a default calendar as well as a birthdays plugin. Birthdays plugin is entertaining because that allows you to scan through your address book find out whose birthday is when, and post it on your calendar. We also support various other plugins. We have the ability to um, get stuff from the XML feature plan um, for the KDE project. This actually reads the XML file on the KDE web page and will show a to-do list of all of the things that are being done um, in the KDE project. We have the ability to journal on a blog. We can post cal um, calendar journey entries um, as the calendar entries as blog entries. Uh, we have the ability to integrate with Scalix, um, Open Change, um, <coughs> GroupWise, GroupDAO, um, various other features. My favorite one is the ability to use a calendar on the IMAP server. This is a new feature that we introduced in the KDE 3 series collab. Um, this allows you to actually take calendar information, store it on an external IMAP server, and share it with other people through shared IMAP folders. This gives you the ability to share contact information, but to use something like IMAP with um, access control lists, 
user accounts, shared folders, indexes, sieve filtering, all these other features that are a pain in the butt to implement if you want to roll your own server. We can use IMAP, an existing protocol, to do the same thing. Um, WebDAV is also very handy, especially if you want to post your iCal format on an external HTTP server. The next part of contact is the address book. <clears throat> Once you can set up um, events, you want to be able to invite people to your address book. Um, again, we support plugins. We have your basic information where st stuff is stored in an iCal or vCard file on your local file system. You can also choose um, GroupDAV, Novell GroupWise, LDAP, um, OpenChange, but you can also do, again, the IMAP folder. This is, again, very handy because if you want to share an address book between multiple people, you set up the shared folder on your IMAP server and store your address book right in there. So it's, uh, it, it's a handy feature to have. One of the other things that's very nice about our address book is that you can um, add custom, inf custom tags and custom information so that um, you can actually design forms um, similar to the way Outlook does forms. You can add a custom form with custom information and um, search and index based off of that. <clears throat> the last part of the information suite that I'm going to talk about here is Aggregator. This is an RSS feed viewer. It has the ability to download and manage multiple feeds, index them, and save them. You can then browse them similar to your, the rest of the email clients and read the rich text here. You can also double click and go to the web. Um, aggregator, uh, all, I should also say, all of these applications are available as separate applications. So if you don't want to actually install all of the, if you just want email, you can install just Kmail and ignore the rest. Same goes for the address book or the calendar. You can just use the single application. We just merge them together into contact to make it easier to configure and manage. <clears throat> okay. I guess I'll, I guess I stop with this slide. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the time tracker and pop-up notes and then take any questions here. Um, basically, the pop-up notes and the notebook and the um, time tracker. Time tracker integrates with your calendar. You can actually say, I worked on this from here to here. It shows up in your calendar. You can also track that against estimated time. Um, one of the neat things about it is that you can match it up to your virtual desktops. So if I have two or three desktops and I do my um, software development on this one and web browsing on the other, I can make it so that it only marks the time for when I am actually using the coding um, virtual desktop. <clears throat> um, the pop-up notes are handy. Again, those are able to be stored on the IMAP server or on multiple backends. This allows you to share this information between different users and groups. Um, so that's about it for contact. And that's about it for the application stack that I'm here to talk about today. At this point, do people have any questions or anything that, I, that they want me to revisit? Yes, sir. Um, at this point, I think it's pretty much widespread. Um, 4.2 is, is the new standard. Um, 4.0 was a technology preview, um, and 4.1 was kind of like the 4.0. Um, I actually myself transferred from three, Stop 3.5 development and went to 4x development in February. So it's, um, it, it's mature, and it's quite usable. I use it as my day day-to-day -day desktop and development desktop at work. Um, it's, performance is better than 3.5, feature set is better, and we have a lot of neat um, things in the pipeline that we just could not do with 3.5.
So it's, I, I would recommend to people who are thinking about upgrading, 4.2 is worthwhile. I think all the major distributions have it in there right now. Um, 4.3 is on its way, so it, it, it's a good time to upgrade. Yes, sir. Um, I didn't have time to get into K Office here, but K Office is released. Um, the it's released right now. Um, the cool thing about it is that um, K Office has the ability to read the ODF format. So if you want to use Open Office, you can. If you want to use K Office, you can. They can share data between them. Um, Open Office has more features, but is a little slower. K Office has less features, but is a lot faster. So it, it has its trade-offs. Krita is also a very good image editing program. For those of you who are interested, I would check it out. Yes, sir. So in metadata, like the file ranking, where and how is it stored? Right now, it's stored by an internal database, um, or data file, per se. Yes, in there. So it's, it, it's per user, it's not disseminated around the rest of the file system. Not at this point, but I could see use cases where selective sharing would be interested. So I have time for one more question. Yes, sir. Yes. Yes, we are. Yes, we are. We are extending that, and we are um, in 4.3. We're adding more search abilities. Plus, there's the ability to write custom plugins, so you can add new meta information as you see fit. So, all right. Thank you very much for your time and your interest. And Stop by the KDE booth if you want to see more in-depth demos or you have more in-depth questions. I'll be there all afternoon. Thanks.